This week I'm joined once again by writer and occultist John Michael Greer to discuss his latest book, Beyond the Narratives, Essays on Occultism and the Future, alongside discussions on religion, progress and philosophy. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my paid patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible, and if you would like to support Metics or become part of the community, please find links in the description below. Enjoy. Uh, John Michael Greer, thanks very much uh, once again for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. Well, thank you for having me on again. I always enjoy it. Uh, we are going to be discussing your... Um, I, I never know whether whether or not to say this with you, your latest book, because you... you I, I, th- I think this one is actually the latest okay. book. Yes, okay. go ahead. Uh, Beyond the Narratives, Essays on Occultism and the Future, which is... Um, I, I would describe it as basically... Many of your long-form essays, which haven't seen print in a while or never saw print, um, or you're you're just going to struggle to find these, and they are all really great essays on the topic. So there's a few sections in it, Druidry, Religion and Occultism, Politics, War and Magic, and uh, The Road Ahead, which is sort of the collapse section. So it sort of spans your whole... Um, you know, range the the main topics you you write about mm-hmm. and talk about. Uh, how did this come about? Were these sort of some essays that you 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 know you you just wanted to get back out there, or was there, was there a reason for this? Well, ba- basically, what happened was that I got to talking with the publisher, Young Books, about doing some anthologies of, short, of my short pieces, and we just I started looking and seeing what I had, and it fell fairly neatly into three classes. There's the the first book, A Magical Education, which is actually talks that I used to give when I was doing the sort of neo pagan convention circuit. And then the other two fell into the other the the other two books were these sort of two divisions of of the work the the, the material that I did when I was mostly focusing on hermetic occultism, which is in the city of Hermes, and then everything since then, basically everything after I became Grand Archdruid of of the Ancient Order of Druids in America in 2004, which which really did mark a significant shift in in my career in in a whole series of ways, and <clears throat> so everything in, that that came after that was lumped together in Beyond the Narratives. And yeah, I, I admit it's a pretty uh, pretty much a gallon offering of things. There's a lot of different different um, subjects in there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And yeah, so I mean, for me, this is one of the, it was sort of tough to sort of find a question which is, which would ease us in to the conversation. And actually, the one that I've got at the start, it doesn't really uh, ease us in anywhere, but it's in the, the I think it's the, the first essay in the book on um, phallic religion in the Druid revival. And you uh, yes. point out, unfortunately, yeah, so this isn't ex- exactly to do with Druidry. The Druidry probably will come in. You point out, I believe it's in this essay, I might be wrong, um, that religions tend to repeat themselves and that the actual logic of religious repetition is found... Basically everywhere, right? Marx is, Marxism is a great um, mm-hmm. example of it. But but why why is it um, and how is it? But mainly, why do you, do you, why do religions why, why do, why repeat do, why themselves? Why do these same yeah. patterns re- repeat yeah, themselves yeah. endlessly? Well, there, there's there's several ways to think about that. But I think the most important is that human beings have certain emotional, psychological, and spiritual needs. And they're going to, and if they want, to, you know, if you want to appeal to those needs, you need to offer them what they need, and that it isn't actually all that diverse. And so, if you want to recruit people to your um, your, your glorious theory about a, you know, a marvelous socialist future to come, you end up falling into religious patterns of thought simply because that's what people need to hear. And the religion of progress, which has been a subject of much of my writing, of course, um, is very much the same thing. It's basically religion with the serial numbers filed off. And all the ba- all the standard cliches, all the standard metaphors are all present there. It's, it's just that, that it's the great God progress instead of, you know, Jehovah or Allah or somebody. And it's, you know, going right. It's um, expanding into space instead of going to heaven or, you know, the glorious proletarian, what have you. It's. It's all the same set of metaphors because people don't change that much, and we we have we have fairly straightforward, you know, emotional and spiritual needs, and they don't. There isn't that much variation in in, um, in what those are and how they need to be met. Hmm. Okay, so do you, do you think of the fact that um, you know it comes around time and time again, whatever this sort of logic is or whatever this abstract apparatus is that we need to have? Do you think that that's a proof of sort of a perennial truth or something, you know, there's something beneath that that is always there that we cling to? Or do you think that actually we need to get out of that cycle to find the truth? 
I don't think we can get out of that cycle. <laughs> Human beings are not that smart. This is one of the great lessons we, we're desperately trying not to learn in our present society. Human beings are not that smart. Um, we, the, the basic groundwork of our thinking, as Carl Jung pointed out a while ago, basically the, the archetypes are the basic categories of our thinking. No matter how we, we turn from this way to that way, we're just working with variations on the same set of basic themes. Um, for what it's worth, I think there is a basic truth underneath it. And I think that, that all of these religions, including distorted ones like Marxism and the worship of progress, are attempts to express things that are actually true, it, just in garbled form. Do you, could, could you, I mean, I, this is a huge question, but could you possibly grasp towards what that truth is? We can't. All we can do is talk about the symbols we have for it. Uh, okay. As I say, we're not so smart. So, you know, pick the, pick the religious tradition that works for you. It's close enough. <laughs> because you're probably not going to get much closer. So why, why is it that we can never get beyond symbols and signs? Well, mainly symbols. Oh, well, you know, it's, that's, that's like I say, why can't we, why, why can't we um, eat without food? <laughs> symbols are what we think with. They're the basic tools of our consciousness. Again, you know, we're not that bright. We are not omniscient. We don't have these vast omniscient powers. The human brain is like six inches long. It's not that big. And symbols and images, similitudes, these are the tools of our thought. These are the things we have to think with. So like, you know, we have hands to pick things up and feet to walk with. And so that's what we have to work with. So, so do you, do you think that um, all these sign, uh, all these kind of people who are trying to get away from that, or want to uh, try prove that humans are far smarter than they are, or you know, Ray Kurzweil type characters? These are people who are really just denying, you know, denying our lot that we've got in the cosmos. We've been given this roll of the dice. Either deal with it and have a good time, or if you don't deal with it, you really you're you're pushing against sort of uh, an objective truth, which is never going to change. Well, the thing is, Ray Kurzweil is just another example of mythology. Um, his, his whole transhumanist thing is fundamentalist Christianity in science fiction drag. We have the singularity in place of the second coming. We have super intelligent computers in place of Jesus. We have space in place of heaven. We have immortal robot bodies in, in, you know, in place of the luminous bodies of the, the, of the elect. Every single point in fundamentalist Christian theology as far as the afterlife of the second coming is duplicated to the letter in Ray Kurzweil's fantasies. So even though he tries to, quote, get away from it, he's simply recasting it in science fiction drag. And that's, that's, what, that's inevitable. You know, again, it's like it's like trying to pick something, uh, trying to pick something up, um, with with your hand without using your hand. <laughs> and you know, you can put your hand in a complicated robot-shaped glove, but it's still your hand that's picking it up. And so, in in, in basically, it's one of the amusements of this whole thing to watch people who think they're you know getting beyond the symbolism, getting beyond the narratives. Um, getting to the truth and their truth is just another rehash of the same metaphors mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so the lessons that have been sort of taught time and time again in this this repetition of uh teaching this repetition of religious truth or marxist truth mm -hmm. or whatever truth it is the lessons that are being taught these seem then to keep people in this cycle do you think mm -hmm. you know we've spoken about it before in terms of a cult using you know in quotation marks because i've over the past few months gone really off the word occult because I just you you know, I'm sure you can sympathize with that. But I I, you, I, I use it I use it all the time. It's 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 a convenient word. Mm -hmm, At any rate, mm -hmm. so yeah, go ahead. But but we've spoken about it before, utilizing, you know, occultist means and practices to get out of that daily grind, that daily cycle mm -hmm. and understanding that there is more to life. You know, I remember one of the first mm -hmm. essays I read of yours was the, the one of the reasons I think it was I'm hoping it was you anyway who wrote this that you notice two people at work working exactly the same job but one of them's miserable and one of them is you know content and fulfilled mm -hmm. and what is it that allows that person to be fulfilled and I you know I believe that it is these practices it is an increased mm -hmm. understanding so do you think mm -hmm. that it is an in-depth sort of spiritual understanding which allows one to get out of this cycle and sort of um, obtain almost a third position or a non-position, you know, get out of that binary way mm -hmm. of thinking. Okay. Um, there are two different things going on here because on the one hand, there are the limits of human possibility. 
mm-hmm. which are fairly sharp. There are, you know, there's only so far we can go as human beings. Then there is the tiny subset of the of that range that is open to people who just accept the, what their culture has to offer them in a sort of blind, unthinking fashion. And that's very cramped. I mean, the range of things that a person is expected to believe, to know, to experience, to do in a modern industrial society is a tiny, tiny subset of the total range of human capacity, which is still not unlimited, but is a lot bigger than sitting on a couch, um, you know, staring at a television and then going to work and doing something dull for eight hours. <laughs> so one of the things that occultism can unquestionably do, and that, that a whole, you know, any spiritual tradition can, um, is is crack open that cultural wall barrier and, and let you see, okay, what if I do something else? What if I push my possibilities as human being a little further in this direction, a little further in that direction? And that's certain that's one of those things that's always available. And it's typically available through spiritual traditions. Now, the downside is that spiritual traditions themselves routinely get drawn into serving the opposite function of pacifying people so they stay within the round defined by their culture. And so you have this constant back and forth between um, spirituality as a way out, spirituality as a reinforcement for the status quo. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things that renders the history of religions, the history of spirituality, the history of occultism so intriguing is watching that that twofold pattern. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Would you would you agree that you know the majority of people, sort of eighty percent plus, are in that smaller category of just accepting, oh, you know, the, yeah, the nine, immediate nine, culture? I'd say, I'd say, I'd say probably ninety-five percent. They're either in the in the sort of media culture, the the daily round defined for them, or they have popped out of that into an equally tiny alternative subculture, which has its own extremely narrow round. Mm-hmm. That's that's very common. It's 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 one of the standard gimmicks for a society to have a set of acceptable variations where you can be all rebellious and antinomian and go do something else that props up the status quo. <clears throat> And to get beyond that, to actually see, you know, see that um, option A and option B are not the entire alphabet, that takes work. And yeah, maybe 5% at most of people ever get around to that. So do you, do you think that's a conscious comfort that they don't, you know, actively, when they're presented with things which might break them out of their bubble, they sort of unconsciously or consciously push them away or do you think you know in in the uh, words of some certain occultists that people are you know asleep or they're completely just unconscious they don't even know that they are in these these bubbles well it varies from person to person um certainly a lot of people are asleep for all practical purposes a lot of people simply go through simply drift through their lives in a kind of shallow doze and most of us can, you know, who've, who've done the occult work can think back on our earlier lives and say, okay, that was when I started to wake up. And we can see being in that dose, being in that, that less than fully conscious state that where most people spend their lives. Then you also get people who sort of lift, poke their head up out of that state, panic, and go back into it. And, it's, you know, it, it's, it's just one of those things. I, I assume... You know, since the universe, the universe is not is not a random phenomenon in the, the spirit. You know, the traditions of spirituality. There's a point to it all. That there's a reason for all this, and um, I can come up with theoretical proposals as to what the reasons might be and so on. But what I know is that most people are content with their with you know following the sort of pattern of life set in place by their culture. They follow what Dion Fortune called the tracks in space that were laid down by by their culture for them. And that's that's their life. That's apparently what they want. And then there are those of us who aren't satisfied with that. And if we can avoid getting sucked into one of those approved alternatives, then we can do something a little more complex. Why the first question of almost any sort of serious occult practice or spiritual practice is, uh, are you satisfied in your life? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and if you're not... Are you willing to do something about it? That's because always the most perfect. difficult step. <laughs> oh, that's the difficult. Yeah, that's the difficult it's one. one. An enormous up. number of people. Yeah, they love being dissatisfied. They sit there being dissatisfied. They will talk to you by the hour about how dissatisfied they are. But five minutes of daily practice to pop it. Oh my God! Don't even suggest it. <laughs> I wonder what, why do you think that is that the people won't even put in the most minute bit of effort to you know potentially because they don't because they don't actually want to change. 
this the thing is people get, get people have comfort, have odd comfort zones everybody has an emotional comfort zone a set of emotions that's familiar to them that they're used to that they can just they can go along their life with they're fine and dissatisfaction is one of those you can be blissfully happy, I suppose, in a certain way. You can certainly be very comfortable being dissatisfied and on the outs. I've known people whose um, who's basic default mode, whose comfort zone emotionally, is being constantly overworked and frantic. If you, if you take a bunch of work away from them, they'll find something else to do so they can stay overworked and frantic. In the same way, there are people whose comfort zone is being angry. They're always finding new things to be angry about. And very broadly, being a little dissatisfied. Being able to talk by the hour about how dissatisfied you are, about how, how marvelous the world will be if you ever get off your duff and do something or if a miracle happens or what have you. That's a very comfortable place for some people to be. Don't try disrupting them by, by offering them some way to change. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The indulgence in negative emotions is the West's sort in, of uh, mm -hmm, Achilles heel. Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting you talk about the productivity one because I see I see that a lot. People who have almost a mimicry of product productive life, but really they are just mm -hmm. stressing about you know they're trying to fill their time so that they can prove to others that they are this super super productive. And when you you know when you try sort of spell it out to them, well, you can just take your time and if you do it like this, you'll be fine. You're actually not that overworked. It's sort of they just don't agree. They just go back into their cycle. I mean, that, exactly. I think that's an important question because it's one I've struggled with before you know i'm not saying mm -hmm. i'm some wise seer or anything like that but when do you when do you what what are the signs when what are the signs in someone when it will be truly productive to actually give them some advice and help um i wish i i, I wish i had a nice <laughs> um you know some so, like a, a little detector meep, meep, meep goes off that says okay this one uh, all i've been all i've ever been able to do is wait for people to ask for advice and then more than half the time, of course, they don't take it. But, but um, you know, something getting on for half the time, they do. So, but I, I, I wish I had a good answer for that. Okay. okay. Um, jumping back, actually, you, you, you've, you know, I, we said that it'd be quite difficult to weave these questions together, but actually you've brought someone in who, I've got a couple of questions here about, because I, you know, I think we both obviously find him one of the most astounding figures. I'm talking of Jung, and um, you've got a mm -hmm. couple of essays which touch on Jung. And this first one uh, is, is you, you, you know, you notice in the essay that a lot of these um, druidic, uh, druidic practices are basically alike or mirroring certain aspects of Jung's mysticism. Mm -hmm. And this isn't about Jung specifically, but, uh, you know, what happens when you, you, you begin to mix and match these practices? <laughs> Well, the thing is, every, first of all, everyone does. Uh, well, no, that's probably not perfectly true. There are doubtless occultists out there who actually just grab onto one tradition and follow it to the letter all the way out. But I have, not, I have never met such a paragon. All of us are constantly experimenting. That just kind of comes with the thing. But uh, Jung is fascinating because Jung presented him himself as a psychologist. And I sometimes think that he was one of the most most brilliant examples of the imposter syndrome in our time. The guy was an occultist. Mm -hmm. He was an occultist six ways from Sunday and 13 to the dozen. He, he studied the occult. His doctoral dissertation was on the psychology of occultism. Um, everything he did, if you know your... your late 19th century occult writings, you can find one reference after another, never, of course, referred back to the occult source. But he, his, his entire mind was shaped by that. And yet, he presented himself as a psychologist. And so, um, it is not at all surprising that a lot of occultists looked at Jung and said, oh, really? I know where he's coming from. And started buying, you know, borrowing his stuff right and left, picking up his books, um, going to do going to Zurich to do classes and things like that. It's, it was it was very a very active scene. And actually I've come to the conclusion that now that now that psychotherapy of the classic example, psychoanalysis, whether Freudian, Jungian, what have you, really is a fading presence in today's in today's psychological scene, you very rarely find it being used. And there are people, you know, it's no, 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 we, we, we prefer to medicate for that or what have you. Um, Freud and Adler and some of the others are being dropped like hot rocks. But Jung remains lively, not in the psychological scene, but in the scene of alternative spirituality and magic. You have an enormous number of people picking up your Jung's red book.
mm-hmm. or what have you, or picking up other, or, you know, picking up whole libraries of Jungian book and saying, oh, cool, here are some neat things that I can add to my occult practice. So I suspect that 100 years from now, people are going to remember Carl Jung as this pioneering occultist who exploded the psychological side of occultism. What, uh, this is what I was going to say. I mean, you, you've, you've touched, you've, you've answered one of my you know, further question, which was, is Jung masking a system of occultism? Because I, I find it almost as hilarious as you, because for years, there's certain books, I think, the Academy and people treating Jung as a psychologist um, mm-hmm. looked at before looking at the others. So, you know, like Ma- uh, uh, Modern Man in Search of Soul and like the, the mm-hmm. book on symbols, you could almost go through that and not think something's awry. But I did an episode on... Um, the Red Book with Paul Bishop, a Jung scholar. And when I was reading uh-huh. the Red Book, I mean, it's one of the most beautiful, magnificent pieces of writing ever in. It's an absolute masterpiece of mm-hmm. whatever it is, mysticism, mm-hmm. I guess. you. It, but... it, it, is, it is an absolute masterpiece of personal occult experience. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, but... it's, it's brilliant stuff. But you read that, you know, when I read that, I mean, obviously I, I was thinking, oh, yeah, Jung, Jung sort of dips. You know, I've read some other Jung up to that point. I thought, yeah, Jung sort of dips into occultism. Mean, there's certainly a current there. And then I read the Red Book and I went, how? You know, he, he's no, he's an occultist first. But I guess he just he's played the game. He just played the, played the game clever because he understood he, that yeah. he's not going to get work. I mean, eventually Freud obviously completely disliked him for that reason. Um, mm-hmm. Because, he, you know, he'd gone too far on the mystical thing and removed all the, the sexual stuff. Um, but it's, it's just amazes me that he somehow retained his position, pr- like as primarily as a psychologist that uh, mm-hmm. it stands. Well, me. He was, he was a good, he was a capable occultist. He cast a spell of concealment on himself <laughs> that made him look like a psychologist and he, and he played it to the hilt and, um, you know, it may, it may have done some good. I mean, at this point. You know, people are people are fleeing that. Uh, Jung is Jung is too Jung is too old fashioned, and of course, you also have um, scholars of the history of occultism who are starting to point out how many of his ideas came directly out of the occult tradition. And so, and you, oh, who was it? Who was it that wrote the the two hatter job biographies, the Jung called Richard Knoll, and the and the Aryan Christ? And those are hilarious, by the way. I highly recommend reading them because you read them and he, basically what Noll is saying is, he was an occultist. Oh, my God. Look, look, he's an occultist. Oh, how horrible. He's an occultist. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and your problem is? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, you know, as we've said before, though, any philosopher or psychologist or thinker who, who touched on that, which, which if you go through the history of philosophy and, and like, major psychology i would say it's probably at least 70 percent of them had a serious interest i mean every major philosopher oh, had had you know i mean i think descartes had these strange experiences with um electricity mm-hmm. and seeing all these flashing lights and he had his strange robotic daughter and can uh, mm-hmm. was interested in swedenborg and every you know and all of this i think you know i one day i would mm-hmm. love to write mm-hmm. a history of philosophy which which you know you you just don't see because oh they've my. it's been it would be it would be about 10 tombs long but it's just been it, it would uh, it, put through a yeah, pressure be, that, of what, radical yeah. contemporary materialism where they've tried to mm-hmm. sort of askew the history of philosophy that oh no look these people were all serious the whole time the whole time but then you look at anyone any of their private journals even you know serious thinkers Wittgenstein people along these lines they all had a mm-hmm. had a I don't want to say phase but an interest in something else mm-hmm. of course they did and yeah, that's it's, and the thing, and it goes both ways. You watch situations where um, um, Schopenhauer, for example, who's kind of a fave of mine, um, his thought, I'm convinced, underlies an enormous amount of 19th century occultism. You look at at um, Elvis Levy talking about the, basically the world as will and imagination. <laughs> that would be will and representation in, in Schopenhauer's terms. But it's basically the same worldview. Mm-hmm. Um, you take Hegel, you know, if you must. Um, <clears throat> I'm not fond of Hegel, you know, but you know where he's getting into his, his um, you know, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, and then the same tri- the same triple pattern, the same triadic pattern is all over um, late 19th, early 20th century French occult writings, where they get into this ternary theory and all this kind of stuff. So basically. Occultism ha- has been part of the European intellectual project all along, 
but nowadays it's it's considered impolite to mention it. It's like, you know, for, well, 50 years ago, um, nobody would talk about the fact that you know somebody's grandmother was Jewish. Let's say, mm-hmm. no, 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 we don't talk about such things. It's not proper, and. <laughs> And nowadays, it's, you know, he got some of his ideas from occultists. Well, we can't talk about that. It's not proper. I hope we'll outgrow that one of these days. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's funny you mentioned Schopenhauer. He's one of my, my favorites, too. I'm reading his biography, mm-hmm. his, one of, his biography mm-hmm. at the moment. And, and I mean, one, it doesn't disappoint because obviously everyone knows he's miserable, but he, tr- he truly was. He truly was an absolute cantankerous, but not for, you know, for good reason as well. His childhood was fairly awful. But um, you know, he had he had a he had a miserable childhood. <laughs> he became the, the the grouch of grouches, and somewhere in there, he managed to pull together one of the most coherent philosophical visions I think our species has yet had. But which eventually, you know, once that was completed, he's he completed that in five years, and then didn't really know. You know, that was his life's work. Is he? Kno- he knew, that was his life work. Uh, and he had no audience yeah. as well. Um, but yeah, what exactly. I was going to say is, been... in his early diaries, he writes about. Um, mountaineering and feeling as if he was above or beyond humanity so you know i think mm-hmm. that current for him was always there mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah and he's of interest also because he was very much aware of things going on in the occult community at the time um in um on the will in nature one of his, his subsidiary books he talks in great length about how um, the the existence of occultism and the existence of magic shows this additional way where the will, an additional form of expression of the will, and so he was taking this stuff very seriously. Mm-hmm. It's you know if you he, he's one of those he's one of those philosophers where you really have to look at him and recognize the difference the the difference between facts and values. Because a lot of his value judgments were, of course, uh, focused, you know, shaped by his miserable childhood and his generally grumpy demeanor. But his analysis of what actually exists and how, how things relate to each other and the, the will and representations and so on is, I think, is is distinct from that or can be distinct from that. And a lot of occultists made it distinct from that. You didn't see Eliphas Levy spending his time moaning about how horrible life of the human existence was. Mm-hmm. I have, a, I have a theory as well that the real left-right divide is Schopenhauer and Hegel, with Hegel on the left, of course. Oh, yes. That's... And I, I think you have a very good point. But, you know, to fully fledge that out would be difficult, but, uh, you know... The, oh, I, yeah. But well, the, the problem of teleology is, you, is the, the main crux yeah. there. Yeah, and the thing is, you, you, the difficulty in fleshing it out is you have to assume that Hegel is actually saying something. Um <laughs> And I, I'm I'm on Schopenhauer's side side here. I think it's specifically the phenomenology of spirit, Hegel's big mighty book. Um, it's literally an asso- a collection of words that does not actually mean anything that was thrown together. Um, oh, do you, oh come on, which is the Gilbert and Sullivan? Um, Patience, Bunthorne's Brian. If this young man expresses himself in words too deep for me, then what a very singularly deep young man this deep young man must be. That was Hegel. Basically, <laughs> running stuff together into a state of total gibberish, because everyone's going, "Wow, this is so profound! I can't even understand it." It's what, yeah, it's one thing. <laughs> that was... Well, it's one thing that's very refreshing about um, Schopenhauer is, is he does the same thing with uh, Fichte and Fichte's ego. You know, the world, the world ego, which is at the the, the sort of the, the masthead of all 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 of after mm-hmm. Kant's. Um, I'm doing lectures on the critique of pure reason at the moment, but I'll get to Victor. But mm-hmm. um, it, whatever Victor's sort of main position is, doesn't matter to Schopenhauer. He says, um, if he was here right now, I'd put a gun to his chest just so he could stop writing this nonsense. You know, as soon as he's realised, <laughs> and he says that word for word, basically, he but he definitely puts said, writes the, the sentence, I would put a gun to his chest and shoot him. Because there's a point where he's you know, he's gone to Victor's lectures and he's just eventually gone. No, you know what? I, I'm not doing this anymore. This is rubbish. You've, you're just mm-hmm. you're just sort of spouting nonsense. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. probably why Schopenhauer is now not very popular and uh, fairly uh, ignored <laughs> as well. <laughs> well, yeah, but the thing is, you get things like um, Hegel's philosophy history, which has caused, I, I think, more stupid things have come out of that one essay than any other piece of human writing. When, on the one hand, you get, of course, Marxism, you get the entire vast, tottering edifice of Marxism, which, ba- which is based on Hegel's philosophy history. 
On the other hand, the pet philosopher of, of fascism, Giovanni Gentile, was a Hegelist. Uh, you get a Hegelian. You get um, the oh come on, Francis Fukuyama. You know, the mm-hmm. an end to history, more Hegel. Any time anybody tries to apply Hegel, apply Hegel theory of history to the real world, the result is abject stupidity. And I don't. I have a hard time thinking of any other system of thought that applied to the real world so consistently produces nonsense and yet it's very attractive nonsense it's very appealing nonsense and people chase after it and so you know we i'm sure in another few years there will be some other hegelian theory of history which again tries to find the thesis the antithesis and the synthesis so your, your did, main did problem you... is it sort of anthropocentrizes history and you know gives across the idea that we could control it if we wanted to well, and it's not even the anthropocentric thing. It's the, the incredible narrowness. I mean, his philosophy of history argues that um, the ancient Middle East, the Greeks, and Germany were all of history, <laughs> or all of history that matters. It's just bizarre. And did, did you, you, you must have read the Illuminatus Trilogy by Robert Shea and Robert Nathan Wilson at some point. Uh, yeah, a long time ago, though. Yeah. Long time ago, um, one of the many worthwhile things in that in that tremendous parody was their take on the missing parts of Hegel's formula. Mm-hmm. Because you see, it's actually five, not three. You have thesis, antithesis, synthesis, followed by parenthesis and paralysis. <laughs> Because the synthesis never actually works, and so you go through 72 permutations or until a paper shortage hits, and then the whole thing falls apart. The best prophecy of the creation of the Soviet, of the creation of history of the Soviet Union, you will yet find. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's easy. We could sit and dunk on Hegel all day, but it's a bit, it's a bit easy. <laughs> but um, fish in a barrel, fish in a barrel. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I, when I look at the sort of uh, lectures online for Hegel compared to someone like Kant or Schopenhauer. There's people mm-hmm. going through Hegel page by page, which I think there's either either you could say, wow, you know, there's this real in-depth interest, or you could say, no, he's so badly written that you have to go through it. Line, you know, this is an hour lecture on this line. And I think at that point you could say it's useless because no one can really read it. And if no one can read it, then any interpretation is as good as any other. And you just end up... And that's, and that- and that latter is what makes Hegel so productive to modern to the modern academy, because the great quest in modern in the modern academic world is, what the heck am I going to find to write my dissertation on? Mm-hmm. Well, because it has to be it has mm-hmm. to be original. So Hegel is an endless source because. Since he doesn't actually mean anything, you can make him mean whatever you want and come up with a new marvelous interpretation of Hegel, and nobody can say you're wrong. Yeah, I mean, I remember um, a friend of mine who just was debating doing a PhD and someone said to them, um, a PhD is an inch wide and four miles deep. Right? You have this, mm-hmm. just this minute, it's just a, it's a ticket. It's a ticket for a job. And I mean, that's, that's all it is. Yeah. I can't say anything else about that. But I mean, we're going to have to sort of jump fairly uh, drastically from let's, Hegel. Um, let's jump. So the the next question is, it was a strange one, which was, I mean, you, you, you were, and probably still are, I imagine, part of the Golden Dawn system for many, many years. Um, mm-hmm. but, and you note know in one of your essays that there is a uh, direct overlap between the Golden Dawn and, and Christianity. And do you think there's a, there was a reason, uh, was it Mathers, uh, used sort of the same structures? Okay, what you're, what you're discussing is the, the essay titled The Hidden Church of the Golden Dawn that points out that the, gold, the grade structure of the Golden Dawn echoes the structure of minor and major orders in um, traditional sacramental Christian churches. Mm-hmm. And exa- why that should be, and why there should be this precise um, echo, which is not present in the Rosicrucian source material of the Golden Dawn, was, was my big question in that essay. Whose idea was it? What's going on here? Was there, as I suspect there was, an intention that if the Golden Dawn had continued along its current track, it would have had a parallel, um, in effect, a track to the ministry? Um, if, it, if, somebody, if, some, if a specific person was involved in that, I don't think it was Mathers. I think it was William Wynne Westcott. Because he was the, I mean, he was the other major founder of the Golden Dawn. He wrote a lot of the knowledge lectures. He was responsible for a lot of the material. Mathers gets most of the credit because he was more colorful. Um, 
one of the things that I, I know now, which I did not know when I when I originally wrote that essay, was that the same year that the um, that the Golden Dawn was founded, 1888, of course, in Paris, um, the Kabbalistic Order of the Rose Cross was founded, and that ended up in very close association with um, one of the one of the French Gnostic churches. And so I think what was going on was something not that dissimilar, that there was this idea that there could be a, a sort of alternative church, the same kind of thing that Dion Fortune ended up creating in her um, Guild of the Master Jesus. Um, there could be a sort of alternative church structure alongside running parallel to the Golden Dawn, where you know, you'd be get, get your neophyte and you would receive the first of the minor orders. And you would go up step by step. Now, the original Golden Dawn, if you if you happen to have a chance, uh, I think it was Darcy Kuntz who wrote the Golden Dawn source book, which has a lot of the original documents or reproductions, a lot of the original documents, like the original application form for membership. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that the original application form for membership says is, you know, you need to be either a Christian or at least willing to ha- take an interest in Christian symbolism. Mm-hmm. So the Golden Dawn was originally conceived of as a as as a form of Christian occultism, and how did it how did it change as it grew? Do you think that's all sort of been stripped away, or, or? Uh, that that was that was pro- that probably went away with Mather or with with Westcott rather, and certainly none of um, none of the successor groups of the original order seem to have caught on to that at all. Although they they lost a lot of things. Um, there was, for example, there was apparently a whole bunch of material about the properties of herbs. Um, Yeats mentions in one of his essays how there was this entire system of doing stuff with herbs that, that he had helped work out and that you could use it to, uh, to, to stimulate certain kinds of dreams. Hmm. None of that survived into the material that we get via Regardi or any of the other sources. There was apparently a lot of stuff that, that had been part of the Order's papers that Regardi never got and that has not has, you know, been lost or has remained unpublished or something. Okay. So apparently this – basically what my, what my essay was trying to do was tease out the bits of evidence that suggested that the Golden Dawn originally – in the original conception of the founders was meant to be, to be run in parallel with a, with a Christian, an esoteric Christian church. Is that true? Good question, but I think the evidence suggests it. Huh. Okay. Okay, so I mean, speaking of speaking of ritual magic, and uh, actually dipping back into what we were talking earlier, talking about earlier about people being sort of kept within a bubble. Um, mm-hmm. One of your essays touches on you know the the spells the modern world world puts on us, and you give sort of the examples of corporate triumphalism. You know, the idea that things are just going to get better, the myth of progress, binary thinking, and 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 in what way and via what means do you think the modern world does this you know and i think other examples would be helpful as well of what spells mm-hmm. we're sort of under in the modern world okay well the thing to keep in mind is that every society casts casts spells like this this is not unique to the modern world it's it's normal in human culture we call it education we call it upbringing this is how you absorb the magic that that structures the world for you so that you can work with other people, you, you participate in the same narratives that they do. And now, our set of narratives, is, you know, the spell of the, the, the myth of progress, um, the, the, the ones that I specifically talked about, were the, the myth of corporate triumphalism and the myth of rescue, the idea that we can divide up the whole world into, as I suggest in there, the characters of Dudley do right. You have Nell, who is tied to a railroad trap. You have Snidely Whiplash, who is who is tying her to the tracks. And you have um, um, Dudley Do Right, the Mountie, who is going to rescue her. And it's this endless rehash of of this this rescue cycle um, that structures a lot of people's lives. They're constantly looking for little Nell, for Nell's to rescue and for Snidely Whiplashes to to foil again. Um, that's specific to particular political currents in our society, but the myth of progress, of course, is the great myth of our time. It is the religion of our time, the idea that history bends toward gizmos. <clears throat> and, um, but the thing, the thing to keep in mind is that every society has such a thing. In the Roman Empire, the, the myth said that um, once things were in chaos and then some mighty force or other came and put order in things and it will continue forever. 
whether that's in a religious context, Zeus zapping the Titans, or Jupiter, of course, in Rome, um, whether in a political sense, it's the Roman Empire conquering the world and, and causing all the, the quarreling kingdoms to stop fighting, whether it's the psychology of the time where the goal is to make the, the will paramount over the desires, it's all the same pattern. And so every society has one. Our myth of progress, I mean, think your your whole goal is to develop yourself as a person or to build your career. It's to progress. People are, left, are, are supposed to think of their lives as progress, as bettering themselves. And then, of course, old age comes and it becomes kind of awkward. But hmm. every, every society's myth has its downsides, has its places where it doesn't fit the real world. Our great crisis as a society right now is that, by and large, the myth of progress no longer fits human experience. Um, we haven't been progressing for years now. We've, I mean, other than a few occasional new gizmos hitting the market. <clears throat> but people can't see that precisely because that's not in the narrative they've been taught. And that's why getting beyond the narrative is by learning, you know, for those who are willing to do so, for those who are willing to wake up, um, getting beyond the narratives can be very useful because um, it keeps one from doing a lot of stupid things and enables one to see the possibilities of one that otherwise would remain invisible if you're expecting tomorrow land to show up on your door tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, a, this is a strange thing. I always think about pro progress. Um, I'm working on writing, writing something at the moment where I sort of outlined mm -hmm. three cornerstones of the modern world as uh, teleology or progress, well, teleology and progress, quantification and technology are the three main things which all combine mm -hmm. in basically every mm -hmm. aspect of life to to alter it and bastardize it in some way to cause you to mm -hmm. be fair cause you to just not see the truth in front of your face but what's what's odd to me is actually progress is one of the things we haven't quantified right we can't dare say right how can we you know define that we're progressing people will say things like oh the the standard of living goes up or <laughs> the economy is getting better and go okay show me that Show me that as mm -hmm. empirical data. And it's the one thing that they can't. And so as, you, as mm -hmm. you've been stating, as you just said, we, ha we aren't progressing. But we're yeah. told, you know, we're still within the myth of that. We're still in this unconscious myth that, that there is such a thing as progress mm -hmm. and we're always doing it. Everything's always getting better. Everything's going to be okay. You're not going to die. Mm -hmm. You'll be plugged into a machine and, you'll, you'll, you know, you're just going to be a brain in a machine. It's going to be fantastic. And, you know... <laughs> But so that's the uh -huh. difference between the myth of we are progressing and the empirical reality of we are not progressing. But of, of, of the regress. people yeah. who the people who notice and point out specifically who point out, hang on, reality doesn't co doesn't cohere with the myth. Mm -hmm. These are these mm -hmm. are punished, and these people just you know surely more and more people are seeing this as well since 2016. So surely we're sort of end entering into a collective madness where you either have to just ostracize yourself and be quiet or a complete willful ignorance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, basically, the, the great crisis of our time is precisely that most of the grand leaps of progress that were supposed to happen have not happened. It It is really worth going back and reading um, middle to late 20th century um, claims about where we will be after the year 2000 and then compare them to where we actually are. We were supposed to have cities on the moon by now. We were fusion power and fusion power was supposed to be a done deal by 1975 and cheap abundant electricity, electricity too cheap to meter. Um, we were supposed to, I mean, we were supposed to have cured cancer by 1980. We were supposed to have, you know, cured the common cold. Um, we can talk about domed cities and flying cars and personal jetpacks and all that kind of stuff. But it was much more than that. We were supposed to have cured poverty because, of course, these, these robot factories churning out vast amounts of consumer goods um, and it would all be wonderful. All this stuff was taken, re taken as reality back in the day. It was taken seriously. And if you actually go back and read these things, read accounts of what the world will be like, or watch movies. Um, 2001, A Space Odyssey, Odyssey, has become one of my favorites just now because the gap between 2001 as it was supposed to be, that's 20 years ago now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? And we ha we're not even close. And yet one of the things that Arthur Clarke did in drafting the screenplay and then writing the novel was try to make sure that the technology was cons 
conservative was not even the far end stuff, but just the stuff that, well, of course, we'll, we'll probably even be further than that, but this we can do and it will be perfectly plausible. And in fact, we never got even got close. And so, and, or, or the, you can go to the other side. Uh, 2021, you know, this is the year that Mad Max was supposed to be set. Mm. Okay. Now, I grant, I grant the Mad Max franchise is they got one thing right. General Humongous wears a face mask. <laughs> okay. They got that right. Other than that, dead wrong. Um, Back to the Future, the second movie of that series. Remember Hoverboards? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Where are Hoverboards? And, and one could go on endlessly. All of these things that, of course, they're going to happen, but they haven't happened. They're not happening. There's no evidence that there's going to happen. And that's increasingly beginning to sink in. And the reason why people are getting so crazy about it, and the reason they're getting that, – that, again, you have to either ostracize yourself or plunge yourself into, into a kind of willful blindness, is precisely that everybody knows at this point that it's garbage. Everyone knows that the, the glorious future of progress is never going to arrive. Tomorrowland has been canceled. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yet nobody can deal with that because that has been the foundation of our secular religion in the industrial world for a century now. If people have built their entire lives around it, they have justified putting up with miserable situations because, it, well, it's exactly the same as the situation in, in the Soviet Union just before it collapsed. I mean, people would put up with all kinds of stuff because our grandchildren will live under communism, you know, the withering away of the state, everything will be glorious, we will all eat peaches and cream. Um, and by the, by the 1980s, it was painfully clear to everyone that that was never going to happen. And you know what happened after that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and we, as you know, Dimitri Orlov put it out a long time ago, we are very much at risk of the same kind of phenomenon here. Hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, that that's his thesis in Reinventing Collapse. But then he also obviously puts in the other point that people in Soviet Russia were far more communal, helpful and generous mm-hmm. to each other. Mm-hmm. And they would also be reliant on far uh, lower tech. Right, so we are in a worse predicament. People, we are the Western oh. world generally, oh, yeah. the US and the UK, highly selfish, highly, uh, you know, complete, mm-hmm. uh, de- you know, completely definable property rights. This is mine. This is not yours. Um, and basically, no ability to repair things or think practically. So, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I don't think it's going to go far worse for the West. I think. Well, it depends. It, it frankly, it depends on where you are. Um, in the, in the UK and in the urban, the two big coastal urban zones of the US, yes, unquestionably. Get into flyover country, while well, property rights are still very uh, sharply kept in mind, um, cooperative activity is still quite common, mm-hmm. and most people know how to fix things. And they also know how to garden, they know how to hunt. Um, there's a lot more practical knowledge in, fly- in the flyover states. And so, yeah, it's going to get pretty ugly in the big cities. Mm-hmm. Um, it's already pretty ugly in the West Coast. Which is why people are fleeing from West Coast cities at aston- an astonishing pace. But yeah, this is um, why I sort of want to start a campaign to just wall off London because I, you know if they want <laughs> if they want the future they can have it. But I think the uh, yeah. uh, I mean, get get it put under a dome. Mm, yeah, I mean, think yeah. what a marvelous science fictional idea. You know, you get a big dome over London. That way they can't get out. Yeah, that'd be great. I'll, I'll I'll talk to them about that. But what I was going to say about the, you know the future that's the future that's meant to be coming. I mean, you know I don't know if you've been looking at the news with Musk where he's talking about obviously getting to Mars and some stuff to the moon. But Mars <laughs> is the big one at the moment, and Musk seems to he's usually quite a cool, calm character. But the latest headlines sound more panicked. Like we have to do it as proof mm-hmm. of like proof of purchase, right? So they they I think the latest exactly. one was we are going to get people to Mars. In, by 2026 and it actually sounded like not it doesn't even matter if it's a rocket anymore right we could just, you know we were just like a trebuchet or something like that it doesn't even matter anymore we have <laughs> we have to get them there nothing else matters like it doesn't matter if they die exactly. it doesn't matter if they can't come exactly. back it's, the the exactly. symbol of them landing on mars is proof enough exactly. that the future is here <laughs> exactly it's because it's a religious thing because that's the that's the sign to the faithful that will prove to them that um, that this the glorious future of perpetual progress hasn't completely abandoned them, mm-hmm. and you know. But unfortunately, Musk. 
everybody nowadays is ignoring the reason why um, the U.S. And the, and the Soviet Union both canceled their manned space programs in the early 1970s, which is that you know space probes determined that outside of Earth's magnetosphere, space is full of hard radiation. Yeah, you can get some people to Mars. They'll be they'll be sick of, radi- of radiation sickness by the time they get there, and they'll die not long after they land. Um, it's the, you know we did not we did not happen to get dealt um, the hand that we thought we were dealt. And we are not, since human beings are not really good at living in an environment of hard radiation, um, the whole science fiction future is not going to happen. Not mm-hmm. now, not in the lifetime of our species. It's just, you know, we, and that's the thing that I think is beginning slowly to sink in. It's one of the reasons that I've been talking in recent books and essays a lot about the radiation issue and some of the other issues involved with, you know, the fact that Mars, I mean, choose the most inhospitable environment on Earth, Um, the top of Mount Everest, the bottom of the Marianas Trench, um, the middle of the Antarctic Plateau in the southern winter, the Taklamakan, where it rains once a century. Um, any of those is more hospitable to human life than the best place on Mars. Mm-hmm. Why aren't we colonizing those first? And the answer, of course, is that Mars is not the, – the, the idea of colonizing Mars, it, it doesn't make any economic sense. It doesn't make any sense at all except within the religious faith in this notion of perpetual science fiction progress. We must you – know, we, we believe in – we have faith in our Star Trek future and we have to get someone to Mars by 2026 or we have to admit that it's never going to happen and we have to have a different kind of future instead. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and this actually this actually ties in with something you mentioned in one of your other essays, which I think is mm-hmm. really um, succinct. Which is, you know, why certain narratives, you know, make it make it to the make it to the top, make it to the papers, make it out into the the world and to the the general population, and mm-hmm. others aren't. And and you you express it succinctly by saying climate change is a narrative of human triumph, right? We're 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 mm-hmm. we're all living sustainable lives. We're going to save the environment. We're all heroes. Peak oil, on the other hand, is a narrative of limits. Of yeah, guess mm-hmm. what? You can't do that. We don't get to do that anymore. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, and and so nobody wants to hear about peak oil. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Well, exactly. I, I was just going to quickly say because um, go ahead, go people ahead. people have. Uh, <laughs> hounded me on Twitter because I guess I could define myself as a peaker. They would known back in the day a peak oil pundit or whatever. Uh, and mm-hmm. p- people people have said to me, "Oh, how's peak oil doing?" Because there was that huge jump jump up mm-hmm. recently because of the shale oil or tight oil thing in 2018, which, mm-hmm. by the way, to listeners, only broke even. No, none of them any made any profit on it, and they won't be doing it anymore. And if you look at the actual Hubert's curve, uh, ex- apart from that jump, it was following it to a T. Um, but one thing people say, oh, how's it doing? You know, have we run out of oil yet? And I always have to make the, the case every time I speak of peak oil, it's not that we're going to run out. That is a, that is a possibility that ca- that could actually happen. Peak oil is when we can, we, it's no longer economically viable for us to get it out of the ground. When the energy is one to one and it's, and it's, you're losing money taking it out of the ground. Of course, no one is going to do it anymore. But people seem to mistake peak oil for like, we're suddenly just going to run out. It's not that. I exactly. just wanted to make that clear. Exactly. I just wanted to make that clear. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's one of the, that's one of the ways, actually, um, one of the things I'm going to be writing about in my first, well, in my first um, blog post in February, I've, I've been taking January off, of course, is precisely this, the use of apocalypse as a fake alternative. The one set of beliefs is more often wrong than the belief in perpetual progress. And so I, you see, I talk about peak oil, but to my mind, what's important is not even the one-to-one point. It's the fact that the net energy is dropping. And so the amount of free energy we have available to maintain our society is sliding slowly downwards with results that you can see around you every single day. Look at the, the crumbling infrastructure all across the developed world, look at the increasing poverty. What's happening is that it's taking more and more of that oil that's being pumped out. It's taking more and more of that energy to keep the oil flowing. Mm -hmm. And so it's as though, to put it in monetary terms, okay, here you have a situation where you invest $1 and get $1,000 back. That's great. 
Okay. Mm-hmm. Then it takes then and but but every every week we'll say the amount you have to put in goes up. So after ten weeks it's ten dollars for a thousand, which is still wonderful. And after a hundred weeks it's a hundred. And you're starting to well, you know, it's still not that bad, but every week that follows it gets a little worse and you have less and less money to spend on anything but keeping the money coming in. Mm-hmm. And long before you get to the point where you're having to pay a thousand dollars in to get a thousand dollars out. Um, you are in really sad shape because especially if you built your whole lifetime around having a thousand dollars a week for basically nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And so, and that's the, situ- that's the situation we're in. It's not that the oil is running out. It's not even that the oil is running, is nearing the one-to-one um, net energy rate. It's that our net energy is sliding steadily and nobody is taking that into account. Mm-hmm. And also, there's the, the the factor of people. People will obviously be screaming right now. But what about the Green New Deal? What about the Great Reset? What about the <laughs> uh, sustainable energy? What about uh, solar panels? And you go, yeah. Mm-hmm. But in your case, there, John, where we've you know we've been one one dollar for a thousand, and then ten, and then eventually, the you know the thing is, at the end, you realize, oh God, we've spent this whole time developing a infrastructure based around this one finite resource Mm -hmm. and we now Mm -hmm. no longer have that resource available in enough abundancy to be able to develop an alternative infrastructure bingo (laughs) so what do you do exactly what do you do well what you do is collapse of course or no what you do is decline decline. let's be precise Mm -hmm. you let things fall apart a bit at a time as they've been falling apart a bit at a time for the last 40 years by the way Mm -hmm. and as the as the decline picks up more things fall apart more things get jettisoned people live more and more in a realm of abstractions and pay less and less attention to the actual their actual surroundings and the crumbling cities and and the whole lot of it and it just slides down a day at a time it's normal Mm -hmm. Speaking of that, I mean, this way civilizations go. Yeah, go ahead. Things have things have to end. Entropy is the the only reality. Um, mm-hmm. Yes, but, but but you know, I just sort of remembered you you recently wrote that that essay on the Great Reset, and this is actually getting more traction than you know all the other. I mean, when I was younger, there was the the big society. David Cameron tried that, and then there was Build mm-hmm. Back Better a few years ago. Oh no, that that is mm-hmm. part of the Great Great Reset. And then there was the Green New Deal, and then there was um, who was the guy who put the solar panels on the Capitol roof, Jimmy Carter. Then there was all, you know, Carter, all, the, yeah. all these all these stunts, um, and now we have the Great Reset. But this one seems to be getting a lot of traction. People are getting scared, and I think it's because they exactly. outline they 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 laid out like specifics this time, right? Which is very rare for you know they said mm-hmm. you're not going to rent anything, you won't own anything, um, and there was some other strange mm-hmm. sp- specifics which really did reek of sort of super luxury space communism. Um, well, in theory, in well, as, as I wrote in my essay, what it works out to in practice is the Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Basically, you know, and, and looking at that, the sheer poverty of imagination that went into the Great Reset, <laughs> the fact that, you know, these people, the, these industrialists and their pet Norwegian uh, politician, when they buckle down together and try to imagine the most visionary, cutting edge future they could come up with, all they could come up with was a place where you own nothing, you're under constant government surveillance, you're dependent on bureaucrats for your daily, for your next day's food, uh, the Soviet Union. They literally could. That's the furthest their imagination would reach. It's stunning. And I think that in itself shows just how far down the slope of decline we've gone. Mm -hmm. The people can't even imagine something actually interesting. Mm -hmm. My sort of theory here is that every few years, maybe five or ten years, these big sort of global global conglomerates and things like the EU or the United Nations, they need to sort of re-inject a bit of hope back into Mm -hmm. that notion of they'll think of something, right? So every three years, it's like, oh, God, they're starting to see that things are coming apart the seams. Let's remind them that everything's going to be okay. It's like that film, The Postman, where he just says, yeah, there's a new president. What's the president's slogan? Things are getting better, right? And it's... And it's like that. Every now and again, they need this little injection. So this is from, this is my theory that this is just the latest one. You go, oh, we're doing this. We're doing this now. Everything's going to be fine. We're going to reset and everything's going to be fine again. I and mean, you can go back to buying, you know, owning 10 houses and you work one job and you can afford 10 cars, three kids and drive a Hummer to work, blah, blah, blah. But that's not going to happen. Like every single other one of these, 
this is just going to fade mm-hmm. away in a few weeks. We'll forget about it. Yeah, yeah, it'll it'll head for the dumpster because, be, yeah, I think you know. Well, think think of the whole transition town movement. Do you remember that? No, no. Tran- transition town. That was a huge thing in the uh, what the late nineties and, and early aughts. There was this big movement uh, centered in Britain and the United States. They were trying to set up these transition town councils in towns around the world, which would make plans to decrease energy and decrease carbon use. And it was the, the quote the most hopeful um, movement in the world. Blah blah blah, and it made a vast amount of noise and it quietly fizzled out because they all made their plans. But making plans is easy. Actually, doing something about this is quite something quite different, and so it just kind of trickled away. I, that, I should do a, I should do a post on this transition. You know, where are they now? <laughs> <laughs> that would be an uh, amazing book as well. Um, you know, that's one of my favorite books about when I, people sort of get into sustainability and collapse. I always recommend the Modern Utopian, which is that guy who Richard Fairfield who assesses all mm-hmm. those eco villages and alternative communities. So many of mm-hmm. them just mm-hmm. amount to nothing because it is, you know, it's like. We always, you know, we say about uh, Barack Obama's hope, like, okay, what are you actually going to do? You know, what is, you know, something as simple as like, okay, where's the well going to be, you know, or anything. Like those lines. They, uh, yeah. they never do it. It's now, just the, pipe dreams. The hilarious, the hilarious thing is that this has been going on for centuries now. Mm-hmm. Um, the Nathaniel Hawthorne, the, the American writer. Um, better known for the House of the Seven Gables. One of the books of his that nobody talks about these days is called The Blithedale Romance. It's set on a commune in the 1820s in Massachusetts. There were communes. And all the same dynamics Hmm. that I saw in the 1970s and 1980s that more recent communards have encountered since then. It was all there in 1824. (laughs) Woohoo! You know what's you know what's strange? I uh, spoke to uh, you might have heard of him, Jakob Lund uh, Fisker, who wrote mm-hmm. Early Retirement Extreme, and he's noticed that um, these things arrive in Kondriev waves every forty years. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you oh, track back track back to people such as yourself or people like Rand Prieur or Dmitry Olov, you know mm-hmm. people who, people who are oh okay, you know we now need to be a bit more frugal, we need to think differently. These people arrive every 40 years and that probably comes off off the back of if you looked 10 years before, the back of the failure of some sort of utopian a, dream. A, a bunch so. of communi- that makes that makes the mo- that makes the most total sense in the world. Does since each of since the communes tend to last about ten years, and people like me and and Ran and Dimitri tend to last about ten years in that role, what comes next? Probably just surely. I mean, acceptance maybe. <laughs> it Sorry. would be you could work out a schedule where mm. you know, okay, it's time for the communes. Now it's time for the you know, let's just okay, let's that didn't work. Let's try simple living. Let's try this one now and that one, and just kind of do it on a forty years rotation. Very useful for those, you know, those who like to who like to make a living, uh, to know what they need to go into next. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, there's, yeah, there's sort of one final thing because we mentioned it quite a few times, and actually, it's coincidental because, uh, or synchronicity, as Jung would say, to reel right mm-hmm. back. I was rereading um, Dwayne Elgin's uh, Voluntary Simplicity, and I believe you, mm-hmm. you've taken this up in an essay you wrote a long time ago. But he, you know, he obviously says. Oh, it's you know instead of uh, you know mandatory poverty, it's voluntary po- poverty because you you sort of alter your relation to what it is to be poor. And we've mentioned you know mm-hmm. poverty in relation to progress. And I realised the other day I googled it because I I live off so little money, but I actually live an extremely comfortable and happy life. Mm-hmm. And I am I live mm-hmm. <laughs> I live below the poverty line, right? And I was like, mm-hmm. oh. Oh, I'm in poverty. I never knew. Um, so it's strange. To, you know what I mean? It's strange. You know, and I'm not. Oh, yeah. I'm not. You know, I'm not sort of. Uh, you know, I'm sure for some people it is. It is a struggle, but I know I'm below that line. So I. It's strange to me. But it, it. You know, it's one of those cases where you think, well, hang on. Surely then, it is entirely what Elgin is sort of on about. It is your voluntary um, emotional reaction to the power of that word, which progress. Mm-hmm. You know, the progressive culture loves. <gasps> You're in poverty. You need to. Get a career, fifty hours a week, and you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, I don't know what you know. This the, the power of these terms, which are thwarted yeah. within the, oh, yeah. the culture. Yeah, and and the, the thing is, I, I had I have a very I have had a very similar experience. These days, my wife and I are not below the poverty line, but we spent a long time there. And once again, 
we, you know, because we were doing it, in, we were doing it deliberately. We had, we knew perfectly well what we, what we were doing. We didn't want to work, you know, the 50-hour weeks. We did not want to live that the, that kind of lifestyle, and we didn't want most of the consumer goodies that um, you're, that are supposed to be the rewards for living that life. And so, yeah, it's getting comfortable with the words and learning how to unpack them and to say no. You know, we're not poor in any but a purely financial sense we have the lifestyle we want mm -hmm, mm -hmm. exactly i mean so poverty really and a lot of the, the notions of what a normal life is in progressive western culture is right we have made it default that you should desire x y and z you know the mm -hmm. the turbo dishwasher with you know 20 attachments which you you say good morning dishwasher and it does everything for you and then breaks yeah, next yeah. week that is, exactly. you have to have that. <laughs> Otherwise, if you don't have that, you know, you're weird and you're you're living in poverty. It's crazy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And and in fa so, in fact, one of those revolutionary things that anybody can do and um, is to look at the the crap that's offered as the reward for participation in the um, in the rat race in the game, and say, I don't want that. I wouldn't take it if it was if somebody gave it to me for free and walk away from it. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's why, um, you know, that's the one kind of dissent that our society cannot handle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's cannot my, it's, handle at all. It's the like Ooh. absurd, almost third position of, right, you know, mm -hmm. we, you know, the, the first thought is, Right, we need a dishwasher. We can't afford a dishwasher, so we're going to have to get one on credit, which is a very common thing now. So you people are mm -hmm. taking years, but then you say to these people, "How about you just wash up in the sink?" And it's like it's like a cog, you know, begins in their mind, like uh -huh. a whole different world. But of course, they go by the dishwasher anyway. They'd probably borrow some. Of money course, they do, and, and yeah, and they, they and then they end up, you know, poorer than they would be. Mm -hmm. Because they have to spend all the money on the on the interest for having bought the dishwasher on credit and blah 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 blah, blah. Yeah. and they could have just washed up in the sink and and, and had money to do other things with. Mm -hmm. And yeah, exactly. It's just it. And, and yeah, one of my favorite examples of this is the the TV effect. When I mention to people that I don't own a television, that I have not owned a television in my adult life, and would not take one as a gift. Mm -hmm. People get very uneasy, <laughs> and they're constantly going, "Oh well, you have to have a television to, you know, to to so you can watch this program." I don't care about that program. You know, looking at little jerky color shapes jerking around on a piece of glass is, to my mind, one of the dullest things you can possibly do with your life. I, I've literally had people scream at me, "You must be living in a dream world." <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going, which of us is spending four to six hours a night watching uh, people, uh, watching actors pretend to be people who don't exist, going through scripted representations of things that never happened? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, just, it's amazing. People are very uneasy about that one. If you, and, and, and there are other things like that. There are, you know, there are a range of technologies that people get very nervous if you don't participate. And right there, I would encourage our listeners to say, oh, okay, then I should not participate. Because if people get that freaky about it, there must be something wrong. Indeed. Um, it seems like a sort of, we've covered a lot of ground there. So it seems like a good place to finish up. <laughs> we um, usually do. Yeah, usually do. We usually do. Um, I'm assuming the best place to get this book is uh, on Aeon Books, uh, which is the publisher. Um, you can go to you can go to the Eon Books website. That would be, that would be an excellent place to go. Or I now um, available on my via my website um, and my Dreamwith account. I now have a bookstore on Bookshop. dot org. Mm -hmm. um, now I think that's mostly at this point that's mostly in the United States, but it's going to be worldwide in the next little while. So people may want to keep an eye on it. But yeah, you can always go to Eon Books and pick up a copy. Okay. That sounds good. Or, of course, your full-service local bookstore. Never forget <laughs> that. <laughs> Don't forget to go outside. They need your love. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, John Michael Greer, thanks very much for once again coming on. Thank you for having me.